So, Alistair, we're talking maps today, um, and we're also talking inequality, which is a big word in the election manifestos uh, this year. But in fact, when we talk about mapping inequality, that's not a new thing. It's been done before. So who was the first to do it? Well, the first person really to do this on a large scale was Charles Booth in Victorian London. And his study of life and labour um, of the people of London is, is really the main one people look to as the first. So people think of him almost as the first social scientist because of it. We've got one of his maps here, which is uh, looking at the area of Whitechapel mm. in London. And mm. just looking at it, it looks like a really normal sort of street map, except yeah. there's colours everywhere. What do the colours show us? The colours indicate the social class of the individuals who live in these different buildings. So, for example, along Whitechapel Road, we can see Charles Booth's category as identified these people as well-to-do middle class, whereas if you just turn off to a side street, all of a sudden you see different categories, very poor or poor, or even the lowest class on his map, which he at the time dubbed vicious semi-criminal. These category labels are, are fascinating because they yeah. say a lot about kind of attitudes towards yeah. the impoverished at the time, uh, perhaps. So in Victorian London, mm. we're going to talk about this cheek by jowl index yeah. that you've developed later, yeah. but in Victorian London, according to Booth, prosperity was always just a little turn away from chronic want and chronic need. Exactly, that's what you see. You don't have to go too far off the main thoroughfares before you suddenly have this intense areas of poverty. How did he collect this information? Well, unlike today when we probably just quickly download the data and map it, he had to get out and about and use up a lot of shoe leather. Also a team of researchers with essentially clipboards and notebooks surveying the whole of most of inner London, effectively, speaking to residents, taking notes, and uh, obviously all this is all online now for us to use, but very much uh, a data-driven exercise, but collected through hard work. So actually, given that inequality is mentioned mm. in all of these political manifestos for the election, it's actually quite a timely kind of thing to have delivered this kind of look <laughs> at inequality across the whole of England. Yeah, I mean, when we started this project about 18 months ago, of course, we had no idea there would be an election anytime soon, but it has sort of coincided with this, and obviously the manifestos mention inequality, so yeah, it's, it's quite timely, we think. So if we fast forward from the sort of Victorian era mm. and look at the, the kind of outcomes of your, yeah. your work at the University of Sheffield, mm. what is this map showing us? This is a map of the whole of England broken down into travel to work areas. So each individual area, like London here, is effectively a commuter zone. So people travel within these to work and these boundaries contain local labour markets. Another example would be up in Liverpool, where you have Liverpool and the Wirral as one local labour market, or Berwick, where the local labour market area goes across into Scotland across the border. So you deliberately didn't use things like parliamentary constituencies and local authority areas because they don't necessarily reflect day-to-day -day human life in the way that these areas do. Because if, if I pick any one of these mm. areas, so if I pick Hull here, mm. this area is defined like it is because most of the people who live here work here. That's that right? right. That's exactly yeah. right. It's, it's what we call self-contained. It's a self-contained labour market area. So that explains what the areas are. Mm. What do the colours mean? This particular measure of inequality relates to how closely packed together people of the same kind of socioeconomic class are. The darker colours indicate where people who are more similar live closer together. Right. And okay. the lighter colours is the opposite. So in the lighter areas, that's where we're saying there's a big contrast in, between the people who live within those areas. That there's, there's, If you like, it could be the haves and the have-nots. Kind yeah, of. exactly. Why do we why do we care about this? I mean, like, why does this matter, do you think? There's a number of reasons. So it could be just to do with the provision of services. Another good reason for caring about inequality would be to do with the political fallout. Right. And how that feeds into the electoral process, which we've probably seen in the last few years. OK, does that mean that areas that are dark, where there's, there's relatively little inequality, these darker mm. patches here across the north, over in the, uh, Cornwall and the mm. southwest over here in, in Lincolnshire, are we saying that those darker areas, that, that, that they're not problem areas? Well, there's, there's a couple of ways of looking at it. One would be to say inequality here is not a problem, but the other, and I think more plausible explanation, would be that inequality is not necessarily the issue, but absolute poverty across the board. So what we have is sort of relatively equal, but quite poor. There's no inequality because everyone's poor. That's More, probably not... Yeah, it's probably not what we're aiming for. What you're aiming for. OK. So we were fascinated by this map when we first looked at it because if we look at just the, the lightest coloured areas on the map, mm. that's the top 20 
most unequal areas in England, according to this data. So if we base it on just the proximity of, mm. of the haves and the have-nots yeah. living cheek by jowl, mm -hmm. much in the way that we just looked at yeah. with the, the, the Charles Booth map of Whitechapel, these areas here are the top 20 for inequality in mm. England. So we have, unsurprisingly, I suppose, sort of London is here. Most of these areas are actually sort of Midlands and to the north of England. Yeah. With the one big exception being in the south, we mm. have the Portsmouth mm -hmm. uh, travel to work area here is showing up as highly unequal. This particular measure of inequality generally picks out places in the Midlands and north of England, which, you know, your traditional centres of manufacturing, your ex-industrial locations. You know, for example, if you look at somewhere like Barrow and Furnace travel to work area, or you look at somewhere like Blackpool, or even... Sheffield's travel to work either, or Hull. These are areas of traditional industry where worker housing was packed very tightly together, much like in the way it was in those Charles Booth maps. So that's really interesting because for me, and I have to reveal like a personal mm -hmm. fact here, I grew up in the Portsmouth area. Mm -hmm. And one of the things when I was growing up is that people always used to describe the Portsmouth area as a northern city transplanted to the mm -hmm. south coast. So it's fascinating to see it coming out here at the national level. Let's take a look, and because I'm biased, we're going to have a look at this Portsmouth uh, travel to work area and see what's really going on there. So what we've got here, first of all, just to show you that we're zooming in. So we've got some mm. satellite imagery here of the wider Portsmouth area. So we're, we're zoomed quite in. Even on the satellite image, we can see mm -hmm. roads and, and so on. But what we can do is if we, if we take a layer, effectively, this is your map zoomed in. Yeah we can see that actually this Portsmouth travel to work area, which is this big yellow area here, it actually extends quite a long way. Mm. And it, in fact, it's a peculiar shape because it, yeah. it's quite tall, but quite narrow. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that that's actually a good thing as yeah. far as the commuting yeah. patterns yeah. are concerned, because knowing this area, I know that there's a motorway going up here and that this is actually a commuting corridor mm. and that there's not as much uh, travel across. So that, that validates the geography. Um, but what we're really interested in doing now is looking mm -hmm. at the neighbourhood level information yeah. that allowed you to make this yeah. area bright yellow. Yeah. So let's bring in this um, neighbourhood level information for the Portsmouth area. And this is the first time that we really start to capture some of that, mm. the neighbourhood level yeah. gradients in, in income uh, deprivation that allowed you to decide which areas of the country were more unequal than others. Again, let's think about the colour. What The colour is now not showing us the inequality, is mm. it? The, the colour is now showing us the actual level of deprivation. That's right. So the individual areas are these sort of 32,000 areas, neighbourhood level, about 1,600 so people or so. That's these very small individual pockets of colour. They're individual neighbourhoods. They're individual neighbourhoods, essentially. And what we see here is the lighter colours. So the lighter colours here yep. are areas that score more highly on the deprivation index. And on the other end of the scale, generally you'll find these in the suburban areas, the darkest colours on the map, the least deprived areas. So they're really usually quite affluent neighbourhoods. Going back to what you were saying mm. about the traditional patterns, and mm. this is Portsmouth city yeah. centre over here, the idea that you've actually got high levels of deprivation mm. in the city centre, mm -hmm gradually getting a little yeah, more affluent yeah. as you spread out into much more affluent rural areas. That's a repeating pattern across exactly. the country. Exactly, that's generally what we see everywhere. Okay, one of the things that fascinated me knowing about this area though is that you don't, in the Portsmouth travel to work mm. area, you don't just have the city centre area yeah. deprived, you've actually got uh, an area of, called Paul's Grove up here which is also coming mm. out as quite highly deprived for income. Um, but also this area up here. Now, this is the area in the north of Haven't, the, the town of Haven't, which is with part of this commuting mm. corridor. This is the Lee Park estate. Yeah. Um, and there's, so there's two points here which are in the most deprived 10% in national terms, which is Lee Park and then a part of Lee Park called Warren Park. You have these multiple pockets of deprivation mm. surrounded by much more affluence. And these areas are not far away from each other. No. Uh, the, the thing that struck me when I looked at this data for the first time was that, so here, this darkest colour here mm. suggests that this is the most affluent 10% mm. in nationwide yeah. terms bordering areas that are in the most deprived mm -hmm. percentiles of the of, of the country. Is that that's the essence of your spatial inequality. That's right. So traditionally what you expect you just expect to see a gradient, a, a geographical gradient where you don't really get these extremes next to each other. There's a number of reasons why you might get that. Sometimes it's brownfield land where new housing has been put and maybe that's more um, luxury housing, luxury flats. And we've seen a lot of that over the last 20 years. But occasionally what you get is a really steep social gradient and 
sometimes it's because of a road, like you can see here, or it might be a river or a, or a railway line, something like that. So there'll be some physical separation, even though they might Usually. be close to each mm. other. Now that takes, again, that takes me again back to Booth, yeah, yeah. because when Booth carried out his two surveys mm. 10 years apart, one of the things that he said was that actually neighbourhood renewal yeah. was one of the things that was helping to reinforce yeah. isolation of the deprived mm. because there was a big railway building boom in, yeah. the, in the period and, and kind of slum clearance programme. And his contention was that building railway lines actually mm. helped to box people in. Yeah. We can still see signs of that, that physical yeah. geography is... is exactly. Doing that. And if you go back maybe 50 years before Charles Booth's map, you have Benjamin Disraeli talking about people living in... Uh, being dwellers in different zones. And if you go back to antiquity in Plato's Republic, we have him talking about different quarters of cities, some rich and some poor. So, you know, these are not new themes, but what we see in the map is we see these patterns repeated at the small scale through time. Uh, but this is the first time we've been able to see this data using your atlas, if you like, to mm. identify the places to look at. So one of the things about looking at the maps like this, though, is that it looks like this area is connected to this mm. area and to this area. Mm but we can see kind of through the satellite imagery peeping behind that actually there is nothing physical connecting those mm. areas because it looks like that's fields and country. So one of the things that we can do here is bring the road network in here and that helps us to really see what's going on because going back to this deprived area here of Lee Park and the Warren here in Havant, if you look at the road network, you can actually see that this area here it's pretty isolated. Although it's very close in geographical mm. terms as the crow flies, there's abs on three sides, it looks like Warren Park here is isolated from these more affluent areas. So let's just take a little nip into here and see what we find. What are we talking about? Lee Park. Lee Park used to have a right reputation for, uh, for, for roughness, did not it? Okay. Yeah. It is a bit scruffy, but yeah, it's uh, it is what it is. But yeah. you know, I mean, once upon a time, Park Parade, yeah, as we used to call it, used to have a main road going up the middle of it. I can remember it. There used to be a Woolies there. Do you think there's still a sense of community in Lee Park? Not as much as there used to be. No, I don't know. I really don't know. I mean, look, the shutters down because yeah, yeah. either no one's in there or they don't open yet until halfway through the night. Do you go to places like Emsworth or no? No, because okay. no, I've only got a bus to get. <laughs> I've okay. got to wait for somebody to take me places. Oh, all right, okay, yeah. So so you tend to stay in the local area for, for, for your day-to-day, -day, that yeah. sort of stuff. Okay. Tell us about growing up in Lee Park. What was that like? Well, I enjoyed it. Um, I've got three sisters and we was all we've all turned out fine, I think. <laughs> So what role does the community centre play for you? Yeah, it's brilliant. We used to go to a youth group here yeah. and now we've obviously both got children. We at least try to come at least once a week, nice and cheap, and it's really local to us. So. Does it feel like a community centre? Do you yeah. feel like there's that sense of yeah, neighbourliness? So do you know places like Rowlands Castle and Emsworth? Do you go there? Do you... Mm, not really, no. no. Do you meet many people from those areas or do they tend to keep themselves to yeah. themselves? Yeah, yeah. sort of. Yeah, if, if we go there, you feel a bit like, oh, where are you from, Lee Park? And it sort of makes you feel a bit awful. But um, yeah, no, it's nice to have something here for us. You know, you have a motorway here, fields and a golf course here, I think. And you can see that it's connected, but only to itself. Yeah. Um, is that, that's, I mean, I know that that was a, a post-World War II housing mm -hmm. estate. Yeah. Is that a, a typical pattern from that sort of era of, of sort of... We do see a lot of that, you know, so good examples of this all across the country. Glasgow's always used as an example. It's a good way of understanding that although people have lives in theory in the same geographical spaces, they're often living completely different lives, disconnected from neighbourhoods that are literally right next door. So this is why we can kind of call this the cheek by jowl index, because yeah. they're co-located mm. almost but living very different socio-economic exactly. uh, uh, lives. Um, and, and the other thing is, with particularly with the Lee Park area, mm. is just how surrounded it is by affluence. I mean, it, what you were saying earlier about a gradient, that mm. just doesn't exist yeah. in any direction. It just, it's a very kind of, it's a steep cliff face, if you like, of, of kind of deprivation, mm. which is fascinating. What would Charles Booth make of this stuff today, do you think? I think I'd be quite surprised at the lack of connections between these places, because at least in his London maps, everywhere was very 
well connected. Here, not so much, and I think he probably questioned the aims and objectives of 1960s planners, perhaps. The locals call mm. this area the Warren because of this kind of network of streets that mm. are inward looking, um, but it scores very poorly on connectedness to everywhere yeah. else. Excuse me, we're doing a little bit of filming about Lee Park. I wonder if we could have a, a word or two with you about it if we parked up the car and uh, yeah, had a quick chat. Is that all right? Yeah. So what brought you to Lee Park in the first place? Um, I got married. I was living in Selsey at the ah, time. Ah, okay. Yeah. I married a, a Lee Park girl. And are you, so you've stayed on the estate ever since? Yes. Do you think that because it is geographically so separate from the rest of Haven, that that actually helps with the community spirit, do you think? Yes, I think so, yes. Um, well, it's a little bit isolated from Haven, yeah. but um, no, it's... I've never seen much trouble up here in 30 years. Right. You know. Do you feel like, like compared to when you were in South Sea, that there's, there's people are more likely to stay in Lee Park in the sense that it is that community space that people don't, you yeah, know, I that think they, so, they, yes. they, they live um, there? There are not many right. people know each other in South Sea. Uh, yeah. Where you would get to know people, it, you get to know people in here. So we're saying that actually it's not like it's even stayed the same. In some cases, mm. because of post World War yeah. II planning, some of these areas are actually even worse than they were back in Booth's day. The old first law of geography tells us that everywhere is connected to everywhere else. And in theory, near places should be more connected. But what you see sometimes is that's not the case. Near places are sometimes very disconnected and very much not like each other. On the basis that it's unlikely that anyone from one of these more affluent areas nearby mm. is going to accidentally wander through yeah. the deprived areas because you have to make the effort to get there and it, there is not a natural flow no, exactly. um, across those areas. Um, one of the things I felt while we were doing this whole exercise in looking at these maps is just what Booth would have made of our cartography. <laughs> the fact that we are letting these areas run out. If I take the road network yeah. off, these areas, they do run into each other. They're kind of space filling, aren't they? Mm, so yeah. although it looks like this is one big area full of people, actually it's a rural area and there's not much going on here. So one of the things that we wanted to do in the spirit of Booth was that with this sort of mapping, we're showing that everywhere is filled with colour. Mm. And that's not really that representative of, uh, of what we're showing. No, and one of the things with these neighbourhood areas that we're using, there are about 32,000 of them and they're designed so that each one should have a roughly similar amount of people. But in less dense areas like out here, where population density is very low, these areas are very, very big. But of course, not many people actually live in the whole area. So one of the things that we did then was to cut through this map with a street and road network that would allow us to get something that looks a lot more like the sort of maps that Booth was making. So let's take those away and replace it with uh, a view of that cut road network. And so here we go. Now I feel a bit more comfortable because it's, it's what Booth would recognise mm. as a map that's very similar to his own. So we've got retained the colours mm. Uh, so the light colours are still the most deprived areas. There's the, the Lee Park estate and the Warren. Here's the city centre of Portsmouth. This is the more affluent areas of uh, Emsworth is here. We're no longer in the Warren Park estate. We're clearly somewhere more affluent. Let's see who we can find. Does it surprise you when I said that this area came out very high for inequality relative to the rest of the country? Well, I've that. Not, that's not been my experience, no. Have you been in Emsworth for a long time? 15 years. 15 years? 15, 16 years. Did you, and, and did you come to it from somewhere close by? or From, uh, from Bob Norwegian. Do you know any of the areas that I just mentioned, sort of like Rowlands Castle, Haven, Lee Park? Do any of those areas kind of... Yeah. What, what's your impressions of those areas? Um, Rowlands Castle... Very nice, yeah. very sleepy. Yeah. <laughs> Lee Park, it's had its day as it is. Yeah. Um, far too big. Yeah. It was the largest in Europe at the time it was built, I think. Uh, haven't, that's fine. It's yeah. a good shopping centre there, good, good area. But the biggest effect is the amount of building that's going on at the present moment. Right. And uh, the stretching of our our services. Well, I, I live in the square anyway. You live in the square and you've been in Emsworth since you were three, you three. Yeah, okay, so how has how's Emsworth changed during that time? Hugely. Across the other side of the mill pond, um, there are houses there which 50 years ago were selling for about 35, 
thousand. Now they're um, half a million. Wow! So the, the, the it's a big, big, big change in the uh, um, in the housing situation, uh, which doesn't help people who've just moved into Wormsworth. And younger people can't really find affordable housing like mm. a lot of places. But Emsworth used to be on a uh, par with Havant in terms of property prices. It's not bad for us that live here, <laughs> but on the other hand, it's not pretty good for people who want to, young, younger people. So given that change, actually, that you've just said between Havant and Emsworth on yeah. property prices, it, does, it, it, does it surprise you when I, I mentioned to what somebody else just a minute ago that this area has been identified as one of the most unequal, economically unequal areas in the country? Um, if it, it, say you take the broader ports. That would, that would surprise me because I think, I think property prices um, vary on a much smaller basis um, than they did 25, 30 years ago. But Lee Park, yes. you know, you may know or may or may not know that Lee Park was built after the Second World War when all the um, houses in Portsmouth were, not all of them, were bombed. Yeah. So the council bought Lee Park, which is a big country house, and they built, it was the biggest council estate in the, the whole of the UK at one stage. But we picked up a lot of the very similar thoughts, actually, in terms of strength of sentiment about local community. But for the first time, I think we also picked up some really interesting things about the way that some places close to each other can have knock-on effects of each other. So the discussion in there about how property prices had ballooned here in Emsworth at the expense of kind of Haven and, and in fact the interplay between Portsmouth and Lee Park with Haven being bypassed that these ideas that although these are separate places they are economically interlinked and what happens in one place can cascade into another is very very interesting. Having a map like this the previous map we had is something we would call a Codopleth map whereas here it just shows you where the buildings are so it shows you where people live effectively in a way that allows us to sort of unpick the urban fabric and get a better understanding of the potential for interaction, but also where the breakpoints are, where you can see, particularly here, the sort of slight geographical separation between areas that are very close together, but possibly not in terms of their social interactions. For me, finally, knowing this area, you really can start to see this Lee Park area for the, for the relatively isolated area mm. that it is. Um, and that they're actually, although they are very close to each other, there are these gaps mm. appearing um, across major segments, right across the, the whole commuting area, suddenly starting to see much more subtle decisions, which, like you say, yeah. are long-term consequences mm. of urban planning decisions. Mm -hmm. The other thing this shows for me is how pioneering Charles Booth was in his representation of poverty and the urban fabric. You know, these kind of things are uh, very difficult to do well, to do simply and to tell the story of places and I think this does a much better job than the previous map in doing that. Where do you hope that this new booth map, if we can call it that, is going yeah, to go? It's really, for us, um, about providing better spatial intelligence. So This is what people maybe know intuitively from their own neighbourhoods, but do they understand it at a national level? So what we wanted to do was provide a national mapping at a local level that would allow policymakers, politicians, members of the public, anyone who's interested in this kind of thing, to understand local inequalities. When I talked to people about what we were mm. looking at with this maps, a lot of people were saying exactly this. They mm. said, well, of course there are rich areas and yeah. poor areas in, within cities, everyone mm. knows them. But I think the thing that surprised me with this was that the colours we're using mm. here are not just for the local area. Mm. These are these areas, places in the national rankings. Yeah. So when we say the difference between a, a bright yellow and a, and a black colour mm. here, that's the full spectrum of the national mm. range in income deprivation. Yeah. So let's have a look, let's zoom back out again and look at what all of those neighbourhoods look like. And so here it is. This is our national view of localised deprivation patterns. So. Just to clarify with you, Alistair, mm. this is all of those 32,000 areas that you were talking about earlier, yeah. all of those neighbourhoods. This is all 32,000 on one yeah. map. What sort of patterns are we seeing when we zoom this out to the national level? The highest areas of deprivation are to be found so in the West Midlands or Merseyside or West Yorkshire or the northeast of England or Humberside. But one of the things people don't often pay so much attention to is a kind of string of deprived seaside locations, and it might not be entire towns, sometimes it's just little pockets. So we have this on um, uh, in Lincolnshire, or we may have that in Essex, or we may have that on the south coast uh, of Kent. So some of those aren't immediately obvious, but 
again, we have that all over. Now, we do say, you know, there's rich and poor everywhere, but they're disproportionately clustered in those places and also in London. And actually, one of the other things that I think I spotted when, when we first loaded this up was mm. that those areas that we were talking about right at the start that don't have much inequality, mm -hmm. you can almost see them on here because of the more consistent colour patterns. So yeah. the southwest and the Cornwall area, there's much less of this alternating bright and dark colour. Yeah. Um, it's more uniformly sort of purple, uh, sort of middling yeah, uh, that's right. In terms of, uh, of deprivation. And finally, I think looking at it in these terms, you finally got a map that really would take the attention of Charles Booth because this is the sort of map he wasn't able to produce yeah. simply because of the restrictions yeah, that exactly. he was working with back in the, in the Victorian times. Great. Thank you very much.